The drive up to the cabin had been a chorus of laughter and eager conversation, the kind that filled the car with a warm buzz, pushing back against the cold, pressing at the windows. There were five of us. Me, Alex, Jenna, Sarah, and Tom. We were a tight-knit crew, bound by years of shared history and countless escapades, this ice fishing trip being the latest chapter. The cabin itself was an isolated little thing, nestled on the edge of Lake Harson, a frozen stretch that promised plenty of pike and trout. It was a rustic place, wood-paneled and cozy, with a broad front porch that looked out over the ice. Snow lay heavy on the roof, and icicles hung like daggers from the eaves. Inside, it smelled of cedar and old, comfortable memories. We spent the first few hours unpacking and settling in. Alex, tall and lean, with a permanent squint that made him look always deep in thought, took charge of stowing our gear. Jenna, whose laughter was infectious and who always wore her red hair in a messy bun, busied herself in the kitchen, unpacking groceries with an efficiency born of her professional life as a chef. Sarah and Tom, both stout-hearted and always ready for a joke, wrestled with the fishing equipment, their voices a constant backdrop to the first act of our little drama. Sarah's curls bounced as she moved, her dark skin a contrast against the white snow outside. Tom's broad shoulders and burly figure made him a natural at handling the heavier gear. As dusk began to paint the world in shades of gray and lavender, we ventured out onto the ice. The lake was a vast, silent expanse under the sky's fading light. Drills in hand, we set about making holes, our breaths visible in the crisp air. There was a peacefulness to it, a quietude that spoke of nature's indifferent beauty. Back in the cabin, as night fell in earnest, we gathered around the old stone fireplace. The fire crackled and popped, throwing shadows against the walls. Outside, the wind began to pick up, a soft howling that seemed almost in conversation with the flames. We shared stories, the kind that seemed fitting for such a setting, tales of childhood adventures, of misadventures at work, of hopes for the year ahead. As we laughed and talked, the warmth of friendship wrapping around us like the quilt Jenna had thrown over her legs, it was easy to forget the isolation of our little wooden sanctuary in the wilderness. It was a perfect evening, the kind that promised nothing but good memories. Yet as the wind's voice grew louder, a whisper of foreboding threaded through the cabin's warmth, unnoticed. The second day dawned gray and overcast, the clouds heavy with the promise of snow. After a hearty breakfast of eggs and bacon, which Jenna cooked to perfection, we prepared for another day on the ice. The weather was still clear, though the wind from last night hadn't quite died down, and the temperature seemed to drop by the hour. As we layered up, pulling on thick coats and thermal gloves, Alex kept a wary eye on the sky. Looks like that storm might hit us sooner than expected, he noted, his voice tinged with concern. The rest of us glanced upwards noting how the clouds rolled and tumbled, as if agitated by some unseen force. Undeterred, we spent the morning fishing, our lines disappearing into the dark waters beneath the ice. The wind was a constant companion, whispering secrets that only the barren trees could understand. By noon, the first snowflakes began to fall, soft and gentle at first, then growing in ferocity as the wind whipped them into a frenzied ballet. Back at the cabin, we watched the storm escalate, the world outside turning into a swirling white void. Sarah, peering out the window with a mug of hot chocolate in hand, tried to lighten the mood. Well, at least we have plenty of food, and this place couldn't be cozier, she said with a smile. Tom nodded, adding a few logs to the fire, which crackled its agreement. Despite the comfort of the cabin, a thread of unease began to weave through our group. The howling wind seemed to carry more than cold air. It sounded almost alive, as if it bore the cries of wild creatures roaming the frozen landscape. Do you hear that? Jenna asked during a lull in the conversation, her brow furrowed. Sounds like... howling? We listened, the sound rising above the storm's roar, a long, drawn-out wail that seemed too structured for the wind. Probably just wolves, Tom suggested, though his voice lacked conviction. The idea of wild animals prowling nearby added an edge to the atmosphere, a prickling sense of being watched. 
As evening approached, the storm showed no signs of letting up. We gathered around the fireplace, dinner forgotten and the growing concern over the weather. The howls continued, now a chorus that rose and fell with the wind. It was mesmerizing, unsettling, and utterly out of place. The cabin felt suddenly too small, the walls too thin against the vast, wild darkness outside. Our laughter had quieted, replaced by shared glances and unspoken fears as the howls echoed around us, a haunting serenade to the storm's relentless assault. The relentless storm had blanketed everything in a thick layer of snow by the time we awoke on the third day. Stepping outside in the early morning, the crisp air bit at my cheeks, the world a monochrome of white and gray. The silence was profound, broken only by the crunch of our boots and the occasional distant echo of the storm that raged through the night. Around the cabin, a startling discovery quickened our heartbeats. Deep, uneven claw marks scarred the wooden walls, trailing off into the surrounding wilderness. Beside these ominous engravings, the snow bore strange tracks, neither human nor animal, a bizarre, unsettling pattern that seemed to defy identification. What on earth could make these, Jenna whispered, her voice barely audible over the murmurs of the waking wind. We spent the morning inside, our fishing plans abandoned, as the cabin became a refuge in a cage. The tracks and marks outside were discussed in hushed tones, speculation mingling with fear. Sarah, usually the most rational among us, proposed theories ranging from stray animals to pranksters, but none sat comfortably with the evidence before us. As the day waned, our isolation grew more pronounced. The realization that we were truly cut off from the world, trapped by the storm and whatever lurked outside, settled heavily upon us. Tom tried to maintain a brave front, cracking jokes that echoed hollowly against the cabin's wooden interior. By nightfall, the tension reached a breaking point. Alex decided to venture outside, intent on retrieving more firewood and inspecting the perimeter. I'll be fine, he assured us, his voice firm, yet tinged with an anxiety he couldn't quite mask. We watched from the windows as his figure, illuminated by a shaky flashlight beam, disappeared into the swirling snow. Hours passed with no sign of Alex. The howling had resumed, now more desperate, more aggressive. Panic began to set in, the cabin feeling smaller by the minute. We should go look for him, I declared, unable to bear the weight of inaction any longer. Bundled up, with flashlights in hand and hearts pounding in our chests, Jenna, Sarah, Tom, and I stepped into the biting cold. The snow had stopped, but the wind was still fierce, carrying with it sounds that twisted our imaginations. We called out for Alex, our voices lost amidst the howling that surrounded us, chilling not just our bodies, but our very souls. The cold was relentless, biting through our layers as we trudged through the snow, calling out for Alex with increasing desperation. The flashlight beams cut feeble paths through the darkness, illuminating fleeting glimpses of the snow-laden trees and the deep, untouched snow. The eerie silence of the night was punctuated only by our footsteps, and the distant, omnipresent howls. Our search was fruitless, and with heavy hearts, we decided to return to the cabin, the weight of our missing friend bearing down on us. Inside, the warmth of the fire did little to thaw the chill that had settled in our bones, or the dread coiling in our stomachs. We need to get out of here, Sarah said quietly, the resolve in her voice mirroring the fear we all felt. The decision was made to leave at first light, to attempt the 20-mile trek to the main road. We spent the rest of the night in a fitful rest, our dreams haunted by shadows and screams. At dawn, we packed essentials into our backpacks, the cabin no longer a sanctuary, but a cage we were desperate to escape. As we set out into the bleak morning, the landscape seemed transformed, hostile, and unfamiliar. The howls followed us, a constant reminder of our vulnerability. The tracks we'd seen around the cabin now peppered the route we took, an unsettling guide through the twisting paths of the woods. The trek was grueling, the snow deep and unyielding. Each step was a battle, and the cold was a constant adversary. Jenna kept close to me, her face pale and drawn, every sound from the surrounding woods causing her to flinch. Tom led the way, his usually jovial demeanor replaced by grim determination. As the light began to fade, Casting long shadows across the snow, the howls grew closer, more menacing. We picked up our pace, hearts pounding, the noise seeming to surround us. 
Just when the terror seemed about to overwhelm us, lights appeared in the distance. A search party, alerted by our overdue status and the worsening storm. The relief was palpable as we were escorted back to safety, the howls and shuffling sounds fading into the night as if repelled by the presence of the rescue team. We never saw what stalked us, nor did we find Alex. The mystery of those days in the cabin by Lake Harson remained unsolved, leaving us with scars that the warmth of civilization could not heal. The creatures in the woods never showed themselves, but their presence was felt, leaving us forever changed, wary of the shadows and the sounds that dwell just beyond the reach of the firelight. Mm -hmm.